Obviously, uh, thanks for everyone to be here. A lot of people are coming from a long way. Um, a few days back, I was giving this uh, poison chalice of a task uh, that is giving an introduction to this uh, three-day workshop. So um, many elements of what pushed us initially to choose the topic uh, have already been presented by my colleagues, who might also like uh, uh, to thank as co-organizing uh, co-organizers, but. Uh, also for the past six years as mentors, it's been a pleasure really working about these questions uh, in this environment. Um, in the next few minutes, I'd rather not make you suffer and go through the proverbial literature review in front of all these experts. Um, and uh, as many of the papers that will be discussed here show, and Olivier was just mentioning this, uh, the issues are multiple and could hardly be summed up elegantly in a 15 minutes presentation. Alas, I am no Olivier Fier. Um, so, I will try to proceed differently as I am young and narcissistic. If you allow me to indulge in a self-reflexive moment, I will tell you a little story. On January 29, 2011, at around 8 p.m., uh, though it seemed more like 4 a.m., uh, I stepped outside of a bus on a deserted large avenue in Cairo. I had flown from Switzerland to come and live the big event I had been waiting for, so to speak, for so long. Egypt was in the midst of its great fear, to borrow from the French Revolution vocabulary. Uh, the bus I was in had been attacked by neighborhood watch groups at least three times, thinking we were thugs, Kapil, that would be the translation, uh, paid by the regime or prisoners who had escaped from prison to uh, uh, loot and cause uh, havoc around uh, the city. The situation was extremely volatile and filled with uncertainty. Violence, or at least the threat of violence, uh, was developing quickly, uh, rumors were circulating very fast, the situation undoubtedly was unprecedented. Um, the day before, on the 28th, police had vanished from the streets, uh, the army had occupied the main squares and roads, a curfew had been instated, and the regime had acknowledged the critical aspect of the situation. The protest had become a revolution. Uh, for me, personally, it was very different as a few years before that I was in Lausanne, so I switched, I switched from Lausanne to people sleeping on a bus. Unable to reach Tahrir Square, where the revolutionary camp was present, and where most of the people I knew would be found, and after uh, straying in the empty streets for about two hours, I was hosted and welcomed by a young man I had met on the bus, uh, and his family, in a working class neighborhood of the capital. Now this family epitomized all of the suffering that had been violently imposed on poorer classes of the Egyptian population for many years. They lived in a tiny one-bedroom flat in a disenfranchised neighborhood uh, with very few social services that held a, a horrendous record of police violations. Quite similar to what Salwa Smaid brilliantly described in her ethnography of Cairo's popular quarters. Spending the night uh, while hearing shots fired outside and uh, the mounting roar of distant clashes, we could obviously hardly get any sleep, and we ended up chatting while watching uh, blurry images on uh, the old TV set. The official live TV was receiving distress calls and uh, airing them live from all around the country, telling tales of mass violence, attacks, rapes, uh, and killings. Every now and then, images of beaten young men presented as thugs or, S or, or SKP prisoners were shown on the TV. The family hosting me was extremely anxious and scared, and to be very honest, so was I. They were interpreting the ongoing event as a descent into chaos, a real threat on their already difficult livelihoods. Soon, the mother said in a trembling tone, we'll be like Iraq and Gaza. Why don't the youth in Tahrir accept the new changes, didn't Mubarak, then president, name a new vice president and prime minister like they want. My host, who was slightly older than me, repeatedly stated how he disliked Mubarak and his regime, how his life was really difficult, was unbearable, that things needed to change. Yet he considered what was going on as wrong and dangerous and refused to take part in it. Not like this, he would say. Interestingly, I realized, mostly in hindsight, how I tended to agree with him at that specific moment. Despite my long vested interest in contentious politics, my personal allegiance, uh, if we say, to the democratic and anti mubarak movement in the previous years, my participation in it, the fact that I had studied protest movements and mostly identified uh, with uh, these actors, despite all of that, my social isolation, my, preference, my presence in an unknown and uncertain environment led me 
not to falsify my preferences, but to momentarily align with what seemed to be the common opinion in the household and the street I was on. Had we not gone too far after all, was it not getting out of hand? Faced with uncertainty, I started to look for clues in my immediate environment to escape social isolation. Even more interestingly, these feelings were completely swiped away on the next morning when I left my host and joined the Hari Square, found all the familiar faces and was overwhelmed by the square's energy. Then for the next day, despite extreme levels of violence and threat, my attitude remained steady. For a few hours then, I was against the Egyptian revolution and I needed to figure out how this ha had happened. The way the event impacted me, the manner in which it disrupted very rooted schemes of perception was an incentive to always keep this force of the event uh, in mind while thinking about the Egyptian revolution and about great political events um, in general. Moreover, it suggested that perhaps it should be, could be useful to take the logics of situation into account how small groups dynamic work, contingency, and the indigeneity of this class of phenomena all seemed as quite important. Um, later on, while starting to read up on revolutions for the dissertation, I was generally amazed to see how different models explaining individual behaviors, when they actually cared about explaining individual behavior, seemed static and stereotypical. They hardly could explain variations uh, around a common theme Differences between individuals from a similar class, similar group, or family, let alone variations within an individual's own behavior over time. While a lot of analyses insisted on broad actors such as the youth, the poor, the urbanites, the middle class, I could see around me the extreme variations in opinions, <coughs> attitudes, and practices of allegedly homogeneous groups. How could we assume that the youth acted in a given way during the revolution when members of the same family uh, who supposedly, as its sociological unit, shared economic and cultural capital, a similar primary socialization, um, a similar religious background, still had very divergent attitudes. I could see that in my family. Each one of us, uh, of my siblings, invested very different things in the event, different levels of interest, different practices, different opinions, whether regarding voting uh, choices, participation or not in street action, position on violence, and so on. Differences were always paramount. And the consequences of the event on our lives, perceptions, and practices diverged immensely and were a function of our differential investments, of course, in the event, but also of our past, past experiences. Thus, coming to the event, participating in it, perceiving it, and being impacted by it, um, on the short, medium, and long run, amounted to very different realities and varied greatly from an individual to another. Two things were thus appearing uh, as interesting to explore. On the one hand, the endogenous property of these events, i.e. The, well, the importance of context, the logics of situation, and on the other hand, what we could call past experiences, um, the different socialization instances through uh, which an individual goes, i.e. you could say, to make them unhappy dispositions. Uh, my initial thought was simple. It would be preferable that an explanation of revolutionary situations, or for that matter of any social phenomena, also be able to explain my own behavior and not only that of the other, to whom for some magical reason different rules uh, would apply. All of these insights uh, led me to think, following many others obviously, that it would be interesting to look at inter-individual inter variations to see how and why individuals in similar classes, groups, constrained by similar uh, institutions, came to act differently. Of course, this was in no means my invention. Rather, it was the meeting point of a context, thinking about events and revolutions, being in Lausanne and in the Krapul, where a certain form of sociology was being practiced, and past experience and education uh, within the French sociology context um, and the contextual disposition of paradigm theory. So here I just applied the theory on my own arrival to the theory. Um, French sociologist Bernard Lahir has championed this sociology at the individual level or individual scale throughout the last uh, 20 or so years. And it might be useful just very briefly to look at some of his ideas uh, from which the title of this introduction is drawn. The title being um, The Singular Folds of Political Events. Lair uh, uses a suggestive metaphor. 
He posits that institution, uh, institutions such as class, family, uh, church, political parties, gender, any, any type of, of social institution, or of structure, if you will, uh, as we see them in the social sciences, pertain to a certain scientific construction of reality, which is reality at the unfolded state. Institutions structure individuals at many levels. They dispose them in certain ways. Yet the social fabrication of every singular individual can take many forms, espouse many variations in the musical sense. Thus, according to Lahir, individuals are to be seen as the social in its crumpled state. The way in which a paper will be crumpled, its wrinkles will always be singular. The same is true for every individual. Thus, understanding individual act, act, actions would necessitate an understanding of both the incorporated past and the specific, specificities of context, the social in its unfolded state and in its wrinkled and crumpled state. In this sense, looking at individual trajectories, whether through biographies, using the concepts of career, uh, looking at paths, routes, and so on, uh, is a way to look at structures and institutions on the one hand, and individual, uh, individual idiosyncrasies on the other. A way to look at both the role of past experiences and the context in which these dispositions might or might not be activated. Obviously, many points and clarifications could be made from here, but I just would like to make three general remarks before uh, opening the floor for today's talks and for the rest of the conference. My first comment or first remark is a theoretical one. Showing, this has been an issue in writing and uh, sometimes exposing to other colleagues what uh, I have been writing, and sometimes it comes as a misunderstanding, I think, of uh, what we're trying to do. Showing interest for individuals in political events has a theoretical foundation. This means that for us to better grasp the dynamics of event, critical conjuncture, revolutionary situations, um, whatever we call them, the focus on what individuals uh, do and think is useful, is heuristic. It helps us see something. And as uh, Ivan Makov suggests in, in the, the paper we'll be presenting uh, next, um, it's the, high, the highly interactive nature of this class of phenomena motivates a microanalytical approach. So, if you're in, in many of the classical approaches of revolutions, individuals are left out. They are not seen as decisive in any cogent explanation of these processes. We posit here that, on the contrary, no convincing explanation can afford to not look at what individuals do and think from the native point of view, to quote uh, Roderick Aya uh, in his refutation of a lot of, of the classical theories of revolution. To understand how events work, how they actually happen, looking at individ individuals seems necessary. My second uh, remark is a methodological one. And I, I should have, I think, put grandiose music for this one, but it's okay. <laughs> Does looking at individuals mean we negate structure? and institutions. Does capitalism not play a role in revolutions? Are we suggesting that agency beats structure? Are we obfuscating power dynamics? Are we champions of free will? This, of course, is not the point. I am not saying it's false. I'm saying it's not even the point. This is not a stance in favor of individualists against holists or for rational choice against dispositionalists. The individual is, above all, a level a scale, a lens through which we can look at the many imbrications of social reality. At this scale, through uh, fragments of uh, social reality, to uh, use the vocabulary of the Italian microstoria, we can reconstruct and understand broader social phenomena. Saying that events are consequences of decisions does not mean that we locate social change in the minds and intentions of those who say they acted in a certain way. It's a different scale, it's a different level. It's a way to look at it, not uh, an epistemological decision on what is more important. Is it structure, is it agency? And my last point, and I would be very brief on it, uh, relates to sources. I think uh, if, we are, if we decide to look at individuals uh, in events and mostly do it in a processual uh, approach, then we have to find the uh, sources that work with this, the kind of data that help us see these micro-transformation uh, on the very uh, short span of time. And here I think there is an, a, a, a strong 
uh, epistemological value on what we might call, I don't know, simultaneous sources or basically sources that are produced during the event that are not linked to the end of uh, the event that is still uh, blind to what will happen uh, after that. Obviously, historians have been uh, using this uh, for a long time. We find it, of course, in uh, uh, Timothy Tackett's work, in Heim Burstyn's work, in uh, Yvon M. Macau's work. So this has been uh, very common in history uh, to try to use elements as personal diaries, as uh, letters, all of these uh, productions, all of these data that is produced during the events. And um, today we could be also using uh, digital threads and traces in that sense. Uh, a place like Facebook is a place where uh, actors can sign and write day to day their impressions on what's going on. And linked to uh, interviews, linked to observation, this can help us better understand some of these small processes and how they work. So this is one of the directions we could go in. Uh, but also I think that there is a, a point to be made about these types of sources, which I personally think are very useful. But uh, a reflection on the economy of writing and narrative construction is needed in these cases because of profusion of data. How do you write something that is still readable uh, in a social science context, in a political science context, and that is not uh, a thousand pages of the font 10 without uh, a single space, right? I'm, uh, I'm not mentioning the that way, but it's, it, is a, it is an issue, and it happens when we have a very limited space in, I don't know, reviews to write, or in book chapters, or in uh, dissertations to... If we're looking at individuals doing portraits, trying to get as... using concepts as the career concept, or, or all these con concepts looking at micro and on very short periods of time, uh, by trying to look for the profusion of data, how do you write this in a way that still is readable? Uh, maybe, maybe uh, actually, technological progress and the use of, of simulations could be a way to look into that. But for sure, we need. I think it, it is important to have a discussion about uh, these uh, things. Um, so um, I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, I think I maybe we could have uh, instead of having a 30 minutes coffee break later on, just have a 10 minutes now and then a 10 minutes later, and then we can start with the panel. Thank you all again uh, for being here, uh, despite the bad weather, and uh, I hope we have a fruitful and interesting conversation over the next few days. Thank you.